In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Tomorrow is the feast of St. Mary Magdalene, and I would like to speak to you about that saint today. Mary Magdalene, as you probably know, uh, was a prostitute. She was a very sinful woman. And her first appearance in the Gospel is in Capernaum, where she bursts into the house of the Pharisee and begins to wash our Lord's feet with her tears and dries them with her hair. Now, there's an interesting footnote about that, and that is when you see St. Mary Magdalene in art, ordinarily she does not have a veil on whereas the other holy women do. And the reason is that she is considered to have sanctified her hair by using it to dry the feet of our blessed Lord. And she is considered to be one of the group of holy women who followed our Lord around. There was a whole group of these pious women that followed him all around Galilee and, his, and his, uh, all of his public ministry. <clears throat> and they helped him. They even helped financially to support the apostles, who could not work, obviously, since they were being trained by our Lord. They provided food. They provided even some money. And she is considered to be one of those. And she appears at the resurrection of Lazarus. Lazarus was her brother. Martha, Saint Martha, was her sister. And although Martha went to the grave, Mary stayed at home grieving. And the Gospel says that our Lord sent for her, because she was very devoted to our Lord. He sent for her. And our Lord knew Lazarus, knew Martha, and knew Mary Magdalene in a special way, a family that he was close to. So he sends for her. She arose immediately, the Gospel says, and went to him. She fell at his feet, saying, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. And she wept. And the scene moved our Lord so much that he started to cry. It's a beautiful scene. And then he goes to the grave and tells Lazarus to come forth. And he gives him back to Mary and Martha. And we see her again in the house of Martha and Lazarus. And while Martha is busy with the preparation for a meal, St. Mary Magdalene is sitting in front of our Lord listening to what he says. And Martha comes in and says, why isn't Mary helping me in the kitchen, essentially? And our Lord said, do not rebuke her that Mary has chosen the better part. That is to say, while you are are, well, are doing a great good by preparing the meal, her contemplation of me is greater than what you are doing. And just leave her alone where she is. And we see St. Mary Magdalene at the foot of the cross, braving the Roman soldiers, the Pharisees, and the chief priests. You can imagine the hostility at the foot of the cross. Romans putting to death three people, then the Pharisees who are making fun of our Lord, the chief priests as well, having their victory over our Lord. And most of the apostles would not even go near the cross. Only St. John was there. But she is there at the foot of the cross, bold. Just as she was bold going into the house of the Pharisee, uninvited, just breaking in practically, uninvited, disturbing everyone, 
making everyone feel disgusted because they knew exactly who she was and what she was. She didn't care at all. And this she did out of sanctity, not out of any sort of audacity, but out of sanctity that there was her Savior and she was going to see him. And our Lord commended her, gave her the beautiful words, Thy sins are forgiven thee. Imagine the amount of sin that she had built up. And she heard from the Savior himself those words, Thy sins are forgiven thee. Imagine the peace that went through her soul when he pronounced those sacred words. And so she's got a, a boldness about her, a good boldness. And we see finally in, that she goes early in the morning on Easter Sunday. She's with those same women, and she's on her way to the sepulcher to anoint the body of Jesus. And she sees the angel in the tomb, and the tomb is empty, and she runs to the apostles to tell them what she saw. Later she returns, and she is weeping in front of the empty tomb. And when she is approached by our Lord, who permits her to think that he is the gardener, he, she again throws herself at his feet. But this time he says, Do not touch me, for I ascend to my Father. And the, the, that it is a hard verse to understand, but m many say that the idea is, Do not cling to me, because I am ascending to my Father. In 40 days. And there is something almost amusing about that scene because she's weeping and she sees, she knows that somebody is next to her, but she's weeping, she can't see very well. And she's, she thinks he's the gardener. And she says, what have you done with him? Because if you tell me, I will take him and, and take care of him. As if she could, by herself, carry away a dead body that would weigh perhaps 150 pounds. But she so loves our Lord that she doesn't think about that trouble or that practicality. She's bold, and she says, I will take him away and take care of him. It, it's a beautiful scene, and th this, it's amusing how she, she says that. But it shows her... Her, the, the force of her love. We are particularly fascinated by terrible sinners who have become great saints. For example, St. Mary Magdalene, St. Augustine, who was terrible in his youth, really bad, didn't convert until he was 35, and then went on to become one of the greatest saints in the calendar of the church, one of the greatest doctors. And there was St. Camillus of Lelis, we just had his feast this week, who led a dissolute life in his youth. And he became a great saint, taking care of sick people his whole life. and St. Ignatius of Loyola, who was a soldier and who was converted after his be, has, having been wounded. And St. Francis of Assisi was also sinful in his youth, but converted. And these people fascinate us because they become not only good people, they become saints. They go from the extreme of sin, the extreme of mortal sin, to the extreme of grace. And it tells us two things. One, that there's hope for us, that if we sin, we could become holy again. If these people could become holy, we could too. And if we have a great deal of sin, 
we can wipe that away by penance, confession. It gives us hope. It also tells us how powerful the grace of God is. That it can take someone in the depths of sin and draw him out, not only to lead an ordinary good life, but to become a saint. Because these saints use what we might call the black coal of their sinful life to be the fuel of a very, very hot and bright fire of the love of God for the rest of their lives. They remain constantly conscious of their sinful life and that burns in them and makes a fire of love for God. <clears throat> and St. Mary Magdalene is one of these saints. Love knows no rest until it finds what it is seeking, possesses what it loves, and holds fast what it has been longing for. That describes the life of St. Mary Magdalene. She would not rest until she found what she was seeking, absolution for her sins. And once she had it, she held on to it by her piety, by her penance, by the complete reversal of her life. She would not let go. And that's why she lunged again for our Lord's feet after he rose from the dead. She would not let go. It's a beautiful life. Now, what should we learn from St. Mary Magdalene? First, Mary did timely penance. Mary Magdalene hastened to the house of Simon, the Pharisee, as soon as she heard of the presence of Jesus there. She burst into his home, as I said, unannounced, uninvited, and there she expressed her sorrow for her sins without saying a word to him. She knew that he knew. And she just wept at his feet. Her, her weeping said everything. She thought most probably that this was her only opportunity to do this. So she didn't care. Who, who thought what? Most sinners do not want to die in their sins. They don't want to go to hell for eternity. They don't even want to go to purgatory. They want to be happy forever. But they often put off their penance. They neglect occasion after occasion to do penance. Death comes and they have not repented. Hell is full of those who intended to do penance but never did. The longer you delay penance, the more difficult will be your conversion from sin. Sin will become so rooted in your soul that you will grow complacent with it. You will be numb to it. You will think of yourself as a good person even though your soul is filled with mortal sin. And you know that it's filled with mortal sin. But nonetheless, you will think of yourself as a, a nice, decent person. That is fatal. Fatal. God, in such cases, diminishes his actual graces. God increases grace as you use them well. Use this grace as well. He decreases it the more you repudiate it. And when you get into that position of a hardened sinner, it's very difficult to get out. I, 
sometimes people who I know are hardened sinners living in situations that are very, very bad will say to me, oh, I'm not afraid to die. And when they say that, I absolutely cringe inside because I know it's finished, that they have gotten to that point where they are absolutely numb to their spiritual condition and they are almost certainly going to hell. St. Alphonsus Liguri was extremely fearful of his judgment. And anyone who loves God and knows the majesty of God and knows the righteousness of God fears judgment. There is an old saying, there is no such thing as a free lunch. And even if you don't have the faith, common sense will tell you that you're not going to get away with sin. We are moral beings. We are not animals. We hold human beings responsible for what they do. And that's why there are courts of law, prosecutions, jails, electric chairs. Because human beings are responsible for what they do. And when they do evil, evil must come upon them as a payment for sin. And that responsibility is not sensed at all among the animals. We are moral beings, and at the end of our lives, we must face our God who made us moral beings, who gave us a, 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 an immortal soul, and be judged by him, and be punished or rewarded by him according to our merits or demerits. Anyone can figure that out. And that's why I say I cringe, because they have lost sight even of that. I'm not afraid to die. The saints were very afraid to go to their judgments. Because they knew God. They knew how righteous God is. And what he demands of us. And they knew that the only way that we could pass to heaven is by asking God for his mercy. And St. Mary Magdalene, secondly, did penance thoroughly. Her mind and conduct were totally changed after her conversion. Totally. She renounced her worldliness and gave her life over to works of piety, following our Lord wherever he went. If you merely confess your sins, but have no change of heart and no conversion from sin, your confessions are worth nothing. And this should not make you scrupulous. For if you really and truly intend to give up your sins and to avoid the proximate occasion of sins in the confessional, that is sufficient. You may sin again, but that doesn't mean that you were insincere in the confessional. But if you go into the confessional with the idea that you're not really going to make any effort, that you're merely going in there to take a shower, so to speak, have a very blasé attitude toward, toward sin, that confession is null. You commit, actually, a sin by going to confession in such a case. You must have what we call the purpose of amendment in confession. But that does not exclude the fact that through weakness you may sin again. And thirdly, St. Mary Magdalene did penance perseveringly. She went to the end of her life doing penance. And we must do the same. Our amendment must not only be thorough, that is deep, but permanent. It must stand the test of time. Remember what our Lord said about dogs going back to their vomit. 
relapse into old sins often brings blindness and obduracy in sin. And that leads in turn to what we call final impenitence, a failure to be penitent on your deathbed, if indeed you have the privilege of a deathbed. You do not die suddenly or by accident. And if you die in final impenitence, you go to hell. If you have mortal sin on your soul. It's as simple as that. So relapse into mortal sins means that you're playing with the fires of hell. St. Peter said this in his second epistle. If flying from the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They again be entangled in them and are overcome. Their latter state is become unto them worse than the former. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of justice than after they have known it to turn back from that holy commandment which was delivered to them. So you should renew daily your resolve to sooner accept death than to commit a mortal sin. Death but not sin, as St. Dominic Savio said. Avoid the proximate occasions of sin and have recourse to prayer and the sacraments. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.